Um, tonight, what I want to do and hope to do is to take us on a little adventure because the story of my life, and as she said, I'm an actor, I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm the son of an artist, a son of a painter, and a school teacher mom. And I was taught from a very early age to live an examined life. It wasn't so important the conclusions you ended up with as allowing the questions to cultivate ever more interesting questions. And I was given a great opportunity in Hollywood because I was allowed to work as an actor, which is a rare thing in itself. But I realized my success in that one world was affording me to live, as she says, in Malibu. But I realized that what was missing was the conversation I needed to nourish my sense of who am I? What's the point? Why is it so difficult to be human? And so over 33 years ago, I started discussion groups in my home, both Tuesday and Thursday night, looking at Eastern and Western inner tradition. Because I always felt that the one thing that's remarkable about our time is access. We have access to enormous libraries, and that's a rare thing indeed. And I wanted to engage my inheritance as a human being. I didn't want to just have a cultural or social model of who I thought I was, but I realized I was the outcome of this great journey of being human. And maybe if I asked questions beyond just my time, my society, I would realize that I'm part of something remarkable. And indeed, this is what I've discovered. I know we all feel this deep in our bones. We know this to be true. But why I'm wanting to share this tonight with you is the art that's come from these questions. Because in discussion, oftentimes, there were points where words only get us so far. But we're filled with a sense of, what is this? It grows in me, it, it animates me, and yet I can't put it into words. And this is where it becomes music, it becomes poetry, it becomes a painting. Because it can no longer be reduced to words, it has to be given life. And it has to be given life through the act of intimate engagement. Meaning not something we've figured out, but actually something we're willing to have a relationship with. And this is what I was taught really as an actor, is the creative arts, if we think about it, is where we're generous with each other. Because when actors show up on stage, we expect each other to be generous. We expect each other to be prepared because we know it's not about any one of us alone. But through an ensemble, we'll create a magical environment that allows people not to leave the theater having to believe something or follow someone, but they will be nourished with an idea, with a possibility, with a conversation that it makes them very enthusiastic. And I'm convinced also that the key to renaissance, the key to cultural rebirth, is enthusiasm. And it's the enthusiasm we share for a story of being human that we can live with, one that we like better. And so let me show you a series of slides that I put together of my artwork that will take us on a journey that shows a lot of my journey as well, because I took the attitude, if the conversation is not in the world, we shouldn't be having a conversation about how it's not in the world. We should bring to the conversation that what we think is missing. And so this has been my journey, is I was, I was blessed with one life, and I realized not to squander that blessing, but to start to create a footprint and a foundation for an emerging paradigm that says, we human beings always know that the qualities of love, imagination, of tenderness, of kindness, all those things that can't be put into a test tube, are the very things that make life worth living. And this is why we have to remind ourselves that we're no longer at a point where we have to learn more. We actually have to part, start putting things into context, and as I say, a context we can live with. So, so this, um, and I'm praying that the gods of technology are kind tonight. <laughs> I often think we are comic relief for a higher form of consciousness. <laughs> and also, I've reduced things to the point where I said, you know what? We are an art form, we human beings. That's the only thing that explains the pain. <laughs> Otherwise, it's pain and meaninglessness, and that's too easy to arrive at. <laughs> so this, uh, this will warm up. We'll get the three birds off the perch here. Um, and I, I titled the, the talk, The Art of Creation and the Creation of Art. Because I wanted to talk about, when we think about painting, painting takes us back to the beginning. We left the painted cave in the same way we left the womb, with the great question of who are we then? 
And when we left the cave, when we left this painted environment, we went in the four directions across the ages, gathering a sense that now we have journeyed through creation, and the art of creation will be when we become co-creative, not simply reactive. And to do this is to make sense of our difficult journey. This is why I call it painted revelations of meaning and wonder, the art and visual philosophia of Lee J. McCloskey. Philosophia rather than philosophy. Sophia is wisdom. We talk about the feminine divine, the incarnation of wisdom. Her principle is life. And therefore, philosophia was the love of wisdom, the love of the first principle. And the first principle is not the process of proving something, but of having a willingness to enter into its mystery. And this is why uh, Joseph Campbell said that the artists of every generation must reinvigorate the myths. And I understood the wisdom because what that tells us is that in our arts, when we don't have simply a cultural or social model, we step into a larger context of what does it mean to be human? When we start to look at the mythic implication of our story, we realize our difficulty as human is not just because of our time, our condition, but it's been difficult across the ages. And when we perceive that, we begin to have sympathy for the ancestors. We begin to understand that this tree of being human has very deep roots, and it's always been difficult. And this is what storytelling, art, and creation will help us to move toward. William Blake said, I must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man's. And this is very important for all of us, because I think on a deep level we all feel that way. It's like the lighting of the candles, enough with it being one candle. It's about the shared light of our greater knowing. This is where we are, this is what we're seeking, and this is why we're gathering here. And that's why my father, who I uh, really account as my, one of my great sages, he had great advice for miss, me. He said, know yourself, be true to yourself. And this last part always stuck with me. Never laugh at another person's dreams. We are so untender to others, and we are so untender to our own dreams. And that's why this is really about the etiquette of energy, trying to create a relationship with mythic archetype, terror revision, and the wheel of creation. What we see here in the front is the terror wheel. Now, this is to make us understand, as we see here, the wheel we're sitting in. Why the wheel is so important is it's going to show us this journey through time, through all of these qualities and conditions, a bit like creating a piano the notes of consciousness. And as we journey, we will finally be able to step in the center of the circle and realize it's no one direction, but when we come full circle, we finally return home. But to do this, we must make sense of why being human has been so very difficult. And this is why with this story of I think, therefore I am, because we talk about the patriarchy. What is that? What was I think, therefore I am? And this is where we'll see my first painting, because everything we see here are my paintings and drawings. This is on the floor of my studio and emerged spontaneously, which is this Christ face. This, uh, this vision that we see the blind eye and the open eye. And when we think about our journey of I think, therefore I am, we enter into time, we enter into separation, because when I think, I think I'm not you. And that's going to be the key that will take us on a journey to develop this wheel of consciousness that we are now at the outcome of. I'm trying to tell us we're all ancient sequoias. We've been on this journey forever. And what we are trying to do is trust the rings of experience we've been developing because they will show us, as the tarot will set the, the tone, in black and white, the keys to consciousness. And because this is a short talk, I won't go into any of the symbolism, but I want us to understand this relationship of lover and beloved, of the above and the below, this reaching toward one another, and at the same time, reaching down into the waters of time. Because what we were talking about, my love across the water, my love across uh, the mountains, my love, and it returns to me, that's very important because this is what this is getting at, that we involve all of the directions, not just one direction, but all of them in our journey. And this is strength, and she will show us the journey about the strength of the deep feminine within us, 
She says, notice there are no weapons here. My strength comes from my capacity to honor the forces that could devour me at any moment. They run through me, they are my pulse, and yet I sit serenely knowing that from within to without, so rather than being lived by these energies, I live and these energies support me. And this is where the moon which we're honoring tonight will take us deeply into the journey, as we can see at the bottom of the fall of Icarus, the journey that we try to get away from ourselves and worship a God that we think is the sun and far, far away until we fall back, realizing there was no there there. Where it was was always here. And so the moon is the turning inward, the realizing that we cannot know unless we trust the ancientness of our body. This is why it's known as corporeal wisdom. She says you cannot know solar wisdom unless you journey the sensuous ancientness of your own true being. That's the key, because this will take us on a journey that will then lead to the sun, the awakening of the third birth, and in the quote of Leonardo, we find this relationship of the one face looking out toward us, the other one looking up toward the chalice and the light of mind. And this will really set the foundation because I'm saying we have all been crucified on the cross of time. We have learned how to move some, so we've been making some headway. But what's going to happen is we're going to begin to hold a double vision. One that says, I see through these eyes and I share this reality. But I once again begin to trust this eye, a sense of wonder to inform my sense of form. And this is the birth of the inner sun. And that's why this knowledge then opens the door to the grail. But if we think like Wisdom Oz, this is where we go from black and white to color. And it's very important because this is going to tell us that the black and white years were about structure. We're all piano builders. And F is not G. A is not B. So to build the piano, we went through a journey to find this to turn us home because she's in my home, and this is Sophia, the great mother. And she reminded me, she said, you know, the father is I think therefore I am, but the mother is I love therefore I am. And we humans are born of a mother and a father. So the question is, in this right angle of the human heart, how do I hold both love and thought? This is why our dear ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras went by the letter Y. Why, you ask? Because <laughs> one was love and one was thought. And when these two come into the crucible of my being, do you see I am I? Because I hold two qualities and balance them with the third presence, myself. These are little stories from the mysteries. And that's why Eve will show up here and begin to take us into the knowledge of the grail. And this is a very important it's called Forbidden Fruit, the Delicious Knowledge of Eve. It's the old heretic in me. <laughs> um, but notice her. She's bringing the third element. And this is very important to our journey. Because art can show us something that says, you don't have to believe me, but consider this. Because what if the journey of measuring all things was finally to come full circle? Meaning, I embrace the right and I embrace the left. There are no evil atoms. You don't like the stories you tell, tell better stories. It's time to know that this, as you can see, I'm not ready to die. But if you think about this in terms of the masculine and feminine, the masculine in us says, this phallic will hold your identity and no matter what, you will not be dissolved, you will not disappear. But now the feminine within you says, trust your energies. You're ancient, you're remarkable, and you're the outcome of an enormous journey that has finally brought you full circle. And that's why on the spines of my books in the library, the grail shows itself on the books of religion. And it tells us that consciousness as an infant, an innocent, is woven of the vision of stars, reaches into each world it is umbilically connected with. And as we can see, which religion doesn't really matter. Because at the heart of all of them is this story that to be human is such a remarkable question. It had to be asked here and here and here. And we were growing a great library of meaning and possibility across the ages. Think of the Akashic Library. Think of these metaphors. But also think about the cave being empty when we left. And that we had to journey across the ages. And what's so beautiful about a book, when you're in a library, somebody lived that. It wasn't just thought about. It was lived. So we've been establishing a living library 
that finally says the grail is when we return home and then she will tell us all his energy. And as I said, there are no evil animals. If you don't like the stories, you tell. Tell better stories. And she adds, begin with the story you're telling yourself about who you think you are. How small have you made yourself? I tell you, you're not born into time. You're born into creation. You're whole and holy and holographic. And you are losing your resistance to knowing these things, which means like a flower finally saying, enough of the bud. There's something in me that just has to let go. And this is what we're heading toward. Because Sophia reminds us with her beauty, with her emergence, as we see her coming up out of the depths in the high of the human soul. This is my painted library studio, which is another talk. But we also see again this Christos, this divided self of the blind eye of the law and the open eye of the love. And from this, though, is this story of communion and our ancient books. And because I don't want to dwell on these, I just wanted to introduce some of these. I spent 21 years uh, following, uh, really, what you say, creation, meaning that I wanted to bypass the need to make intellectual sense out of a creative impulse. So I followed this improvisatory energy. And what started to emerge were these ancient texts and the journey and knowledge of what were known as the Watchers, which is a talk for another night. But this is the divine portal, because what I want to do with these is to introduce into our uh, inner sensibilities that many of the questions we can't answer don't have an answer any more than love has an answer. Love says, love me, don't critique me, don't figure me out, don't want to walk with me. Look at this flower with me. Let's fall in love. That's why I'm called love. We've been thinking about love for so long, we've forgotten how to do it. And this is why we have magical womb. These, these are intimate pages looking into eternity's gate and ways of, of entering the heavens I could not enter otherwise. And this is the other thing. In the mystery traditions, and this is what we don't understand because we have a very Western sensibility, and people bandy the word, oh, it's only a pseudoscience. Well, from the Renaissance prior, we would have bandied the word, oh, your science is yet only a pseudo art. Because the highest quality was when something became art, not when it became analysis. It wasn't so good as to know what pigments and, and chromium were used on the Sistine Chapel as to look at the Sistine Chapel and to begin with, my, isn't it beautiful? And this changes the conversation. This is why we have to take back how we're being told to define what we value and what we consider to be true. And that's why this painting of mine, Universe is Organism, these were journeys that took many years to explore, to uh, journey into. But they all are setting the ground of when, when I would ask questions visually and they would take me on a journey, they became truly my mentor. And this is why Ascension, which was an early painting of mine, what I'd like to point out is that we've been journeying through time. Remember I talked about the history body, the sense of the journey, through the ages, think of the Bindu point, I'm getting there, think of these two eyes, getting there. But we have this vertical line, we see this quality of ascension going up into the light of mind. And this will tell us a very important story about ourselves, because the knowledge of being human is the reconciliation of two opposite impulses. And as long as we've been journeying through time, we think it's about getting there. Down the road, it'll be there. So we worship the God of the elsewhere. When it's when I'm dead, that's when I get there. <laughs> Which here yeah, you got it. Uh, <laughs> and this is saying, no, no, no. Let's go back to the wheel. Let's realize that we enter and we follow through time. We think we're going in a straight line, but actually we're what following the curve of space. But we finally realize we're actually walking in a ratio that allows us to finally realize we can stand erect. And this is the relationship to the winter solstice ending of our Mayan calendar. Because this is when we stop moving forward in time and stand erect. In other words, when we stop following the outer changing motion of the seasons, and like the axis wundi, the spine, we are that which realizes like an ancient tree we have grown from these roots to hold the vision not simply of our humanity, 
but of humanity itself. And this is the beginning of our holographic awareness, which isn't about learning more. It's about falling in love with the more interesting idea. Because I believe me, in terms of what opens within us, it's the ideas we're willing to take responsibility for and the places we're willing to uh, look into. And this is why the last part of this is based on a painting of mine called Phoenix Arise that I had finished over a four-year period in 1997. Why this will become so fundamentally important is that, not to give anything away, but it will create all of these things. I created it in card form when I published my book on the tarot, which I heartily recommend to anyone interested in the theater of the psyche and also the reoccurrence and the reassertion of the deep feminine gnosis, the heroic feminine, which has really been culturally and socially dulled down. I mean, the high priestess really needs to be known, and the moon as it flowed through me needs to be known. It's the only way I can put it. It, it, it. Because we're up here when we should be here. I feel like an archaeologist has kept, has kept going, let's go deeper. But, you know, it doesn't stop there. Let's keep going down. So that's why I printed this in card form, and I dropped the cards. And when I dropped them, they created, as we can see, this remarkable yoni between creation and creation, the above and the below. So suddenly, this stable form, a painting I had created, remember, painting's what? The first language. Painting is the language of creation because a painting does not come through a formula. It comes by willingly entering the mystery of not knowing. And it is called spontaneous creation. Well, guess what? That's what we humans are born on, spontaneous creation. If you cut us, mathematical principles do not flow out of us, although what flows out of us can be reduced to mathematical principles. <laughs> we have to invert the mathematics that's occurring. And that's why when I put this together, it astounded me because it didn't reveal just this story, but actually a DNA double helix holographic weave. And we can see here this story of the egg, that double helix, the weave, the tantra, creation and creation. So what is this showing us? Actually, it's showing us that we are an art form. Like can only be known by like. This suggests through painting, humankind and our DNA is an art form of consciousness. And I like that story better. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why also when I turn it this direction, notice how the slim eye, it becomes the slim eyes and the slim mouth of the ancient alien face we so often see. And, and wait until you see that because it's a, it's a dawning moment. But I started to think about a tree. A tree that didn't know it had roots. So anything underneath the soil is what? Alien. But if you think about the roots, it's not about communication by and thou of something you see, it's actually about trusting the root system to inform you because you're inspired. So not by what you've seen, but by this knowing. I grow out of an enormously ancient matrix. Let me honor it, not by figuring out with these eyes, but this sense of wonder. And that's why, Creation, original, it didn't stop there. I played with the cards and discovered this relationship of holographic recapitulation. And Pythagoras, our dear Greek friend, uh, and, and master of the mysteries, said that God geometrizes. But nobody asks, what did God geometrize? We think it's number because he said, all is number. But he would have been horrified with us to not understand that it's about archetype, being, entity. The reason we ancient Greeks don't teach fractions to anybody else but the initiated is two-thirds of a dog is a dead dog. Anything having to do with life has to do with whole numbers, whole entity. So we're actually seeing this in graphic form. And as it goes around the circle, we see the umbilical serpent or the Ouroboros, and we see this remarkable moment when it comes full circle and the first mandala that revealed itself from my painting is just as in the story of the phoenix bird of immortality. It returns and what? Builds a nest. And there's a nest and feathers. And so it's actually showing us this first fractal mandala, meaning that all the geometries are created from the recapitulation of the one creation. That's pure Pythagoras. 
So we actually look at that, and once the nest is built, it erupts into flames. I pulled out the cards and it erupted into flames. And I kept pulling out the cards, and it doesn't reveal random flames, but we'll see that it actually blossomed. So a painting, creation, is blossoming. And the story is telling us in pictures, the most ancient language, and in fractal mathematics, the most universal language, is that we humans are going from a contracted or nesting to an expanded or blossoming stage, and that when we look at this any other way, it opens all of these mandalas, all of this, and it will grow to remarkable sizes, and we will see how it creates from one painting infinite blossoms. And I think that's very Aquarian, meaning that we will realize that we are all born of creation. We all blossom with unique geometries, and yet we are one. And this is where Jung said, we know from experience that the protective circle, the mandala, is the antidote for chaotic states of mind. The God image within us reveals itself as the mandala. And isn't that this? We are one. We are light that divides itself into unique expression, unique geometries, unique blossoms. But we are all composed of creation. We all share that light. And that's why the eye of Sophia, which is here, will show us the sun and the heart. They're all suns, S-U-N-S. And there's a very fascinating Hopi prophecy which says the knowledge of the sacred DNA is in the weave of our baskets, and they look like Indian baskets. And my home is on Shumer ceremony ground. And all of the work is about honoring the ancestors. And that's why the phoenix arise creating creations blossom, the phoenix arise coming full circle, and we are returning home, and as we said, this is my home, my painted library studio. And Phoenix Arises, we can see, is a large painting within it, uh, five foot by seven foot. But it's at home. It's in a domestic footprint. It's very important because we think it's all outside of where we live. And this story is actually we're returning home to our intimate space. The Phoenix is uniquely with each of us. And this brings us to the end where I love Emerson, and he said, beauty is the creator of the universe. And that's why when we see the wheel on the outside, we see the structure, homo sapien, I think, therefore I am. But on the inside, we see the blossom, homo luminous, radiance, I love, therefore I am. And therefore we are each a phoenix, a unique blossom of creation. We are the human form divine. And we are whole, holy, holographic. We are the outcome and embodiment of a great question lived across the ages. What does it mean to be human? Oh, Phoenix, arise.